I am very honored to introduce our guest tonight, Tim Bray. I've known Tim for quite a while. We've been uh, Audubon buddies for years, and um, and uh, Tim gives the best weather report that I can imagine. I tune in to listen to his Irish music uh, on on Sunday mornings on KCYX usually so that I can catch that weather report because it brings in the marine weather report. Um, so anyway, Tim Bray was a hydro di uh, geologist by study and by career. And then he ended up, he and Catherine came to the North Coast, not quite sure how many years ago, but uh, they've been here for a good chunk of time. Wonderful members of our community. And uh, with that, I introduce to you Tim Bray. Thanks for being here, everyone. Well, thank you, Sarah. You kind of flattered me a little there. Uh, I have been here for 22 years. It doesn't seem like that long uh, because there's still so much to learn here. Uh, but I've made a number of great acquaintances along the way, and you're certainly one of them. We had a lot of good years together on the Mendocino Coast Audubon Society board. I miss you at those meetings, uh, but uh, it's really great to see you doing so much. And I just want to remind everybody else, uh, in case you were unaware, that Sarah just received the Matt Coleman Award for Environmental Activism uh, just last uh, Sunday. We presented that to her at the, the meeting of the Environmental Partnership Coalition. And uh, it was a really wonderful afternoon and an extremely well-deserved award for someone who does so much work here. So. Thanks, Sarah, for all of that. Uh, I'll just go ahead and share my screen and get started on the talk because uh, uh, I do have an awful lot. Go ahead, come on. There we go. I have an awful lot to talk about, so I'll just get right into it. Uh, hopefully, you all can see my title slide there. Perfect. This was originally going to be titled Seabirds in the Marine Food Web, but I just could not limit myself to uh, seabirds. So I'm going to start off actually on the beach very briefly uh, and try to get into the ocean as quickly as possible. I do feel, despite Sarah's kind words, uh, underqualified to present on this topic because there are so many people that know so much more about it than me, uh, but I will do the best I can. And uh, had a lot of great people to learn from over the years, uh, most notably my co-host on the Ecology Hour, Bob Spies, who uh, together he and I have in interviewed an awful lot of eminent scientists about marine biology. And that's where a lot of the, what little I know about the science out there, that's where it came, mostly came from. Okay, oh, there we go. Um, and uh, quite a bit of it came from this guy, of course. Uh, just wanted to remember our friend Ron LaValley, who passed away uh, just about a week ago and introduced not just me, but an awful lot of people to the wonders of pelagic seabirds and uh, his enthusiasm uh, and knowledge of the subject were incredible. And so we all miss him. And uh, I think in part, uh, I have to say he was the inspiration that led me to being able to do a talk like this. All right, let's get right into it and start talking about the food chain and the food web and what those concepts mean. Uh, I want to make sure that there's some understanding before we get into the birds. This is a pretty classic uh, illustration of a food chain, and that's uh, that's the way most people are accustomed to thinking about uh, the ecosystem relationships. Uh, it's a real simple model, uh, but it does actually convey a lot of useful information about the way energy is transferred through an ecosystem. So it starts at the bottom, of course, uh, the bottom of the food chain with plants. And since we're in the marine environment, that is predominantly, but not exclusively, phytoplankton, uh, which are tiny little plants. And we'll talk about size and why that matters a little later on. The phytoplankton is consumed by the zooplankton. Those are the tiny animals. And then the zooplankton is consumed by small fish. And then big fish eat little fish, the classic 
food chain, right? Step by step. And at each step, energy is transferred from one level to another. Uh, one important concept is that you lose about 90% of the energy between each of these steps. So by the time you get to the top, uh, you, you have, uh, you know, you've lost 90% four times. And that has a big effect on how many of the carnivores you can support. Uh, biomass correlates to the energy available. So the phytoplankton are taking energy from the sun and through photosynthesis, they convert that into forms of chemical energy. And then that's consumed by all the animals up the food chain. So it matters a lot how the phytoplankton work. And we'll talk a little more about that later on. But you can see that at the top of the food chain, you've got big fish, big mammals and seabirds, lots and lots of seabirds. Of course, it's not really that simple uh, because the food web actually has a lot more pathways in it. And so birds can insert themselves at various points in that food chain. And there are more than just phytoplankton at the bottom. Uh, when we're in the nearshore marine environment, as you can see over on the left, there's vegetation that grows right on the seafloor or on the rocks. Uh, benthic is the name for that. Benthic vegetation, it's large, so it's called, it's, they're called macrophytes. Uh, this, of course, is the kelp and the seaweed. And that stuff in the nearshore marine environment is extremely important, uh, as is the phytoplankton offshore. The benthic vegetation is grazed directly by fish, by small creatures, by, and by birds, believe it or not. So basically, everything in this little cartoon uh, is essentially birds are eating everything you see on this, except maybe the humans. Uh, we don't really leave bodies out long enough for the birds to get to them, otherwise they happily would. So a little bit of science here. Um, what we have in the nearshore marine environment off Mendocino is mostly a eutrophic system, meaning it's well nourished and it's nourished because of that upwelling. Sarah mentioned the talk that was uh, June of 2021 by Marisol Garcia Reyes, and she gave us a talk entirely about upwelling and marine heat waves, which are two very different uh, phenomena. In the upwelling talk, uh, she went through the mechanics of it. It's pretty interesting stuff. The physics of upwelling are fascinating, and I really wanted to talk about it, but I could not find a way to do it in less than 15 minutes. And that uses up a third of my time. So, <laughs> so I'm going to direct you back to that to the video of that talk for more about upwelling. And who knows, maybe we'll talk about it later. Uh, but the net effect is upwelling brings nutrient rich cold seawater from the deep sea up to the surface in the near shore. And when it comes up there, it gets oxygenated uh, by wave action and it gets exposed to the sun. And that triggers uh, phytoplankton bloom. Uh, the ocean turns green. And in particular, it grows large phytoplankton. And that turns out to be really important because the large phytoplankton, principally diatoms, uh, and by large, I mean 50 to 100 microns. Uh, some diatoms get to be as much as 200 microns across, which is pretty big for a one-celled organism. Uh, they do aggregate, and I'll show you some of that. The large phytoplankton, are their particles are large enough, they can be grazed directly by large zooplankton. These are the small free-floating animals that are herbivores, and they graze on the large diatoms. And those, in turn, are large enough that they can be eaten directly by fish. And so you have a three-step food chain so the energy transfer from one step to the next step is really efficient. And uh, you wind up with 1% of the energy available that you started with, which is a lot because the sun is shining all over the ocean. This is what I'm talking about. This is a phytoplankton. This is the aftermath of a phytoplankton bloom. I took this picture uh, from my kayak uh, just, just outside of Russian Gulch about uh, two or three weeks ago. And uh, the surface of the ocean was covered with these aggregations of 
kind of gooey, stringy, green slime, sticky. Uh, it would get all of your fishing gear. And this is, in fact, phytoplankton. These diatoms, uh, as they grow, exude a kind of mucus uh, that causes them to stick together and form these ropey agglomerations. When you see that in the ocean here, it's a really good sign. That is an indicator of health because it means you've had upwelling, you've had cold nutrient laden water come in and get uh, aerated and irradiated by the sun and then the phytoplankton do their thing. These things grow extremely rapidly. And so without the upwelling, what happens is they, they almost immediately deplete all of the available nutrition and stop growing. And uh, we'll talk more about what happens when that happens later on. But in a, in a system like we have here where the wind blows all spring, and lately it seems like it blows all summer too, that the wind is driving the entire system. So this is wind-driven upwelling. And each one of these bouts of wind will trigger another uh, fresh influx of nutrient-laden water. And that drives primary productivity by means of these phytoplankton blooms. Let's get to some birds, shall we? It's supposed to be a talk about birds after all. <laughs> so uh, we're not into the seabirds yet, but I had to start with shorebirds for a couple of reasons. Um, one, I wanted to maintain my friendship with Becky Bowen. She'd never speak to me if I didn't talk about shorebirds at all. And two, these Western sandpipers are really interesting shorebirds because they graze directly on phytoplankton. Uh, this is a relatively recent discovery, I think. And they, like most shorebirds, they run around in the mud and uh, uh, on these algal mats, probing away at them with their bills. And they catch and eat some arthropods and insects and things like that. Uh, and for a long time, it was assumed that like every other shorebird, that's what they're mostly eating. But it turns out that they get a great deal of their nutrition directly from slime, <laughs> the biofilm that grows on mud flats and on these uh, shallow water environments. And uh, they're, I don't know if they're unique. I think this is uh, something that they're just starting to look around and see how many different animals are actually doing that, living on directly off of plankton. But these Western sandpipers are an unusual shorebird in that they're, uh, they've inserted themselves almost you know, one step up from the bottom of the food chain. So up on the beaches, uh, you get seaweed, right? Uh, or beach rack as the technical phrase. And you know, this stuff is growing in the ocean, uh, washed by that nutrient laden water. So it grows really fast and it becomes very nutritious. And then the waves tear it loose and throw it up on the beach. This is a bonanza on the beach, which would otherwise just be a barren of expanse of sand, right? Uh, so the technical phrase for this is a macrophyte rack subsidy, uh, meaning it is an addition of food resources from outside of the local environment. Uh, so this pectoral sandpiper is not actually eating the seaweed, it's eating the bugs that are eating the seaweed. So there is a wide variety of arthropods and crustaceans and insects that burrow into this decaying seaweed you can see all those beach flies buzzing around. And these migratory sandpipers uh, depend on this to fuel up on their way to and from the breeding grounds in Alaska. So these pectoral sandpipers don't stay here. They're only found here on migration and they rely on this uh, seaweed on the beach essentially to fuel up uh, on the way. Okay, let's get into the water, shall we? Just off the beach, this is, as far as I know, the only strictly herbivorous marine bird, uh, or at least the one off the, our coast. This is a black brant. They are a small goose, tiny goose, actually. They're, I think they may be smaller even than cacklers. They're barely bigger than a big duck. Uh, very elegant little birds. And they are primarily grazing on seagrasses, eelgrass. And uh, the big eelgrass beds in Kamalas Bay, there's a big eelgrass bed in Humboldt Bay, and then there are immense ones up off the Alaskan coast. And that's what these guys depend on. We have some eelgrass in some of the estuaries here 
there's a pretty good stand in the Albion River, and there's some in Big River. Um, they're tiny by comparison to what's in Tamales and Humboldt Bay, um, but there's a little bit here for the black brant to stop off and graze on on their way further north and, and south on migration. You can see that one guy on the right there actually has a little bit of eelgrass in his bill. Uh, herbivorous bird. Okay, out to just past the surf line or actually in it, you get these guys. And these are an interesting little duck, the surf scoter, one of three species of scoter that we have here. And they're benthic feeders. So they, uh, benthic means the seafloor. So they dive and root around in the sand and the mud on the seafloor and use that gigantic comedy beak to scoop up uh, invertebrates. Primarily, in the case of scoters, they're primarily eating bivalves. So they're, they're actually digging clams out of the seafloor and they, uh, small ones, and they swallow them whole and then crush them in their gizzards. So they have an interesting feeding style. And I think scoters are the only ones that actually do that. Most of the other ducks are either grazers or are eating uh, something else that they can get more easily than fishing around in the sand. But that's why you see these guys uh, in and adjacent to the surf. Another benthic feeder uh, that we do have locally that breeds here, these are really fascinating little birds, the pigeon guillemot. Uh, they, they breed on the rocks, uh, actually in the rocks. Their nests are tucked back into crevices where you can't see them. They, they fly up, land on the rock, and then disappear into it. And then they fly out and feed, and they tend to feed mostly on the, uh, the rocky shoreline where the bottom is rocky. And they go down to the bottom and pull out. In this case, uh, I think that's probably a blenny. Uh, uh, one of several different species of eel-like fish that live in crevices in the rocks. They will also forage in sandy bottom for sand lance, um, but they're primarily diving and uh, they actually can fly underwater with those wings and propel themselves with those giant bright red feet uh, at a pretty good pace through the water. So they can catch midwater fish, but they mostly are going after fish down on the bottom. So is everything else. Everything wants to eat fish here. So <laughs> I don't have nearly enough time to go through all the different birds that are eating fish in the nearshore marine environment. So I just crammed a bunch of them onto one page. Uh, these are pretty much all Ron LaValle photos. And, uh, and I could have crammed a lot more in here. There are three species of grebe. Uh, you can see the, the murs, the murrelets. There's three species of cormorants here. Two or three species of terns, and that's just in the near shore. There's some more further out to sea. Uh, and then down on the lower left, those red breasted mergansers. Uh, the other kinds of merganser are primarily freshwater ducks, but the uh, red breasted is a marine fish eating duck. Uh, Pigeon guillemot that we just talked about, this, the picture there on the bottom is one in uh, winter plumage. And then we have three different species of loons that spend some time here as well. Uh, and so all of these birds are either, uh, are primarily fish eaters. Some of them are exclusively fish eaters, like the osprey, for example, and the loons. Uh, some of them, like the merlets and the mers and the gilmos, will take uh, invertebrates from time to time, but they're primarily going after fish. Like uh, this guy is a, <laughs> is a generalist feeder. He will take a number of different kinds of prey. In this case, I wanted to include this because it's a fabulous photo, uh, not only of a rhinoceros auklet with his, his rhinoceros horn. So he's in full breeding plumage uh, or she, I don't know which sex this is, but has a mouthful of sand lances. And these are a type of forage fish. Uh, he's, mentioned them in that first slide about the food chain. Uh, and forage fish, it turns out, are incredibly important in the marine food web. There are a number of different species of them. They, uh, most of them are schooling fish, but sand lances live in the sand at the bottom. And they will dart out of the sand, grab food, and then burrow themselves back into the sand. 
and a variety of different things. We'll dive down there to the bottom to get them, including auklets like this one. Uh, I have no idea how it is mechanically that they managed to catch multiple fish and hold them in their bill on a single foraging expedition. The puffins, of course, are the champions at that, but the uh, auklets can do it too. Let's talk a little bit about the fish. These are the northern anchovy, and these are probably the single most important forage fish on, at least on our part of the coast. Uh, they're probably deserve an entire hour just on anchovies. Uh, we, should, we should find an anchovy expert to talk about them because they're really complicated and really, really super important. Uh, but among the characteristics that make them important for our purpose tonight, they are very oily. That means they're energy dense. You see that guy in the middle with his mouth wide open and they have that enormous mouth. He's not just yawning. He isn't bored by my presentation, uh, these are filter feeders. So most fish dart about in the water and grab individual bites of prey. These guys swim rapidly through the water and filter the water through their mouth and grab little bits of plankton. So they are directly consuming both phytoplankton and zooplankton, um, although mostly I think it's phytoplankton that they're, they're getting their nutrition from. So they are right above the bottom of the food chain. That means uh, there's a lot of biomass for them to work on. And that means that it's really efficiently transferring energy from the phytoplankton up to the next level in the food chain. So these things are schooling fish. They form these enormous schools, uh, sometimes just staggeringly big. And they have boom and bust in population. They have a, some kind of a cycle that's not very well understood, but uh, big years are usually not, uh, don't usually happen consecutively. So we probably won't get a year this year like we did last year when we had just an absolutely epic year with Northern anchovies off the Mendocino coast. Uh, and there was a greater concentration of them here, I think, than either north or south of us, and that led to an immense concentration of birds feeding on them. And, <laughs> and this is uh, just one of many photographs uh, of that activity. So this was, Roger took this photo and many other great shots off Ward Avenue. This is right off 10 Mile Beach. And it's just off the beach. This is happening right outside the surf. And uh, all of the creatures in this photograph are feeding on anchovies. So the brown pelicans are the most obvious ones, the big, kind of big diving birds. And I'm sure most of you remember, uh, those of you who live here on the Mendocino coast, remember last year as the year of the pelican. There were thousands of them here, uh, a spectacle like probably no one alive has seen here because uh, it was only 50 years ago that there were only a thousand of them in California. 500 pairs in the Catalina Islands uh, where they breed and they produced a single fledgling in 1972, one chick. Uh, and of course that was the DDT problem. DDT was banned, there's a whole story there, but they have recovered now to where there, nobody knows how many there are because they were taken off the endangered species list but there's probably between one and 200,000 brown pelicans off the Pacific coast now. They have recovered spectacularly well. And I would guess that we had somewhere around 10,000 of them here on the Mendocino coast last summer. Camped out on the rocks and just banging into the water all day eating anchovies. Now take a look at some of the other birds in this picture. Uh, just below that one that's plunge diving, you can see a gray gull with a bright red bill. And to the left of the plunge diving pelican, there's a dark uh, kind of brownish bird. Those are both the same species. Those are Hermann's gull. And Hermann's are an interesting little gull. They, uh, they are found in association with brown pelicans because the gulls, the Hermann's are what's known as kleptoparasitic, meaning they steal food from the pelicans. So if you've watched a brown pelican feed, you know it scoops up a big old pouch full of water with some fish in it. 
and they can't swallow the whole uh, that whole pouch full of water they have to get down to the fish and swallow those so they have to open their bill and push the water out and when they do that sometimes a an anchovy will slip out as well and the hermon's gull is sitting right next to the pelican and just grabs it sometimes the hermon's gull does not wait for the pelican to accidentally drop one and when it opens its bill to push water out the gull will reach inside and grab a fish directly out of the pouch it's really something to see also in this photograph we've got some western gulls those big ones off to the left uh, and in between them there's a harbor seal so there are two immature western gulls and one adult with the white head and then in the background there's some blurry birds that are common murs. We'll talk a little more about those. But everything in this photograph is eating anchovies. There was an enormous school of anchovies that just was stuck there off of Ten Mile Beach for weeks. And they just, every day, these birds would just pile into them. So here's a nice close up of a common mer with a fish. Uh, I can't tell if that's an anchovy or some other kind of a fish because they will take whatever's available, but they eat in years like last year, they are pretty much just eating anchovies one after another. The thing I want to draw your attention to with this photograph is look at the wings of this bird in relation to its body, uh, both the shape and size of the wings. So one interesting feature of common murs is, uh, and I just learned this recently, they have the highest wing loading of any seabird. And wing loading is the ratio of the weight of the bird to the surface area of the wing. So it's a measure of the uplift that it takes to keep the bird in the air. And that means they have to flap really hard to stay airborne. And if you watch them fly, you'll see what I mean. They, they fly like rockets, they go really fast and they flap their wings uh, continuously and very rapidly. And that's a really energetic way of getting around. And so the only way they can really do that is because they're eating a lot of very energy dense food, namely Antuit, those northern anchovies that I showed you a few slides ago. Everything else is eating them as well when they're abundant like that. We're going to move a little further offshore here. This is a pelagic gull called a black legged kittiwake, uh, a small and quite handsome gull. They breed on rocks up by Alaska. And then in the non-breeding season, they come down here and forage off the coast, but they almost never come on shore. It's actually quite rare to see them even from land. I've seen them, I think three times from land, but we took a whale watching cruise in January, uh, got about a mile offshore and there were hundreds and hundreds of them out there, all plunging into the water for anchovies. The black legged kittiwake is one of the few gulls that actually plunge dives like a tern. So when a bird does that, plunges into the water and comes up with a fish and flies around with it, it can attract some unwanted attention. So these are another pelagic seabird uh, that is very, very rarely seen from shore. This is the parasitic Jaeger. There are three species of Jaeger. This is the one that is most commonly seen from shore because they will chase terns sometimes all the way into a bay. And if you're at the mouth of the bay, you can see these guys fly by. So they're called parasitic because that's their lifestyle. They fly around on those big wings. Uh, notice the difference in proportions. Uh, the, the size of the wing on this bird compared to the size of its body, much, much greater wing area than the MERS have. So they are very agile flyers. It's no trouble at all for them to stay in the air all the time. And they fly around watching for other birds to catch a fish. And when they see that, they immediately fly over there and just basically start beating them up for their lunch money. Uh, and uh, they're, they're so good at flying and they're so aggressive that the bird that caught the fish eventually decides it's easier to just drop it and go catch another fish. And the Jaeger will immediately do these acrobatics and grab the fish in midair before it hits the water. Quite a sight. Uh, 
These you can see on pelagic trips just a few miles offshore. You get uh, five or six miles out, you start to see Jaegers in the fall anyway. Also at about that distance, uh, maybe a little further, this picture I think was probably taken about 10 miles offshore. Not a great photograph, but uh, it shows something I wanted to bring your attention to. So these are two species of phalaropes. Phalaropes are a small shorebird actually, but they don't uh, spend much time on the shore. In fact, hardly any of these, these two species. They're always on the ocean. Uh, and they have an interesting feeding habit. They spin around in circles and create a little vortex that brings small critters, uh, little arthropods and crustaceans and larvae and all kinds of little things that are in the in the water, but just below the water level where the phalaropes have a hard time finding them. Uh, they create these little vortexes that bring those things up to the surface and then they just pick them out. So they're, they're fun to watch. Notice all the floating crud in the water behind these birds. Now, like I said, uh, this picture was taken several miles offshore. So we're out in the open ocean and most of it is just bare clean water. And then all of a sudden you'll come to a line of floating crud uh, or rack is the actual technical term for it. And these rack lines, it turns out are extremely important, uh, especially for seabirds, but basically for everything in the marine food web. So those rack lines form where you have two bodies of water converging. And there are currents everywhere in the ocean and different currents swirling around bring different bodies of water up against each other. And uh, when you have a, a convergence like this, you tend to concentrate uh, a lot of food resources right along the line between those two bodies of water. So these convergence lines are favored hunting places for not just birds, but fish as well, uh, and even whales. Basically everything is looking for these things. They're kind of like an edge habitat on land where you get a much more productive, much more concentrated uh, ecosystem at the edges of two bodies of water than you do out in the middle of either one. So watch for these. You can see them from shore sometimes. They form up all the time. Okay, we're starting to move pretty far offshore. So I thought I would stop for a moment and talk about the uh, somewhat different food chain that happens offshore in the open ocean. If you're far enough out that you're not getting the effects of upwelling, uh, and because of a thing called Ekman transport, the effects of upwelling can extend uh, a number of miles offshore. Uh, and under certain conditions, 30 or 40 kilometers offshore, you can still get that nutritious water. But when you get far enough out, uh, the water isn't mixed up very well, and it becomes what's called stratified. And the surface water is very quickly depleted of nutrients by the microbial growth. Uh, that means that the diatoms cannot grow as large as they do closer to shore where the water is well mixed and, and nutritious. Uh, I should uh, define the term here. It says oligotrophic, and that just means undernourished. So in an, uh, in an oligotrophic system, you get small phytoplankton. You still get a lot of phytoplankton, but they're limited in how fast they can grow by certain nutrients. And the, the rate affects the size. And so they can't grow to the large size that the diatoms can inshore. So you tend to get, instead of diatoms, you get uh, dinoflagellates and cyanobacteria, microscopically small phytoplankton. They're so small that the larger zooplankton can't really graze on them directly. Uh, even the filter feeders can't really, like an anchovy, can't really just swim around and fish out the microscopic phytoplankton uh, because the, the mesh size basically isn't small enough. So there has to be an intermediate step and you have to have microscopically small zooplankton grazing on the tiny phytoplankton and then those zooplankton are in turn available for the larger zooplankton, things like krill and copepods to eat. And then finally, the fish can get some energy out of the system. 
So if you've been counting that up, it means there's two more links in the food chain. And each of those links, uh, you lose 90% of the energy. So the net result is you get a lot less energy available at the top of the chain. And that's kind of what these trophic pyramids, these are actually triangles, but imagine that they're pyramids because it's a volumetric thing. Uh, these are a kind of a way of visually summarizing what I just said, that in a three link food chain like we have near shore when we have upwelling, you get large phytoplankton that can be directly grazed by the large herbivores, meaning krill and anchovies primarily here. Uh, and then that means those are in turn available for all of the carnivores, everything from fish to birds to whales. And then in an open ocean situation where the water is stratified, it's not well mixed and you don't have upwelling, so there's no continuous in, input of nutrients. Uh, you get microscopic phytoplankton, the cyanobacteria, the dinoflagellates, uh, about which I should say a, a little more later because they can be not only are they not as nutritious, but they can actually be toxic. Those are then eaten by protozoans and microscopic uh, herbivores. And then the zooplankton starts to eat those and then the forage fish. And then eventually some of that energy gets up to the carnivores. But as you can see, you have maybe 1% of the energy available at the top of the food chain in an offshore system that you that you have in a nearshore upwelling system. So that drives not only the abundance and the biomass, but it also means uh, the birds in particular have to have a different strategy. Their foraging strategy is different. This is a beautiful little image uh, of the pelagic food web, pelagic meaning open ocean. So the interesting thing about the open ocean is, is it's vertically stratified. So these three main layers are really important. So the euphotic zone, that just means uh, well lit. Uh, sunlight will extend down to a maximum in really clear water of about 600 feet. Uh, in cloudy water, much less, of course, so it doesn't get nearly that far down near shore, but out in the open ocean, the water can be very clear. So that's the, the upper layer that's well lit. Uh, it's depleted of nutrients because at the very surface, there is uh, biological activity that's basically consuming nutrients as fast as they're available. Uh, and then in the twilight zone, during the day anyway, you have all these other forms of life, copepods and krill and, and uh, some shrimp that are midwater swimmers. And in particular, uh, the squid that you see right in the center of this image, extremely important forage food for a lot of the pelagic creatures. And the key thing that goes on here is every 24 hours, there is this immense vertical migration uh, of large schools of all of these creatures, fish, squid, and crustaceans are migrating up and down in the water column. So at night, they come to the surface to feed on the phytoplankton and, and the surface biofilm and the, the nutrition that's available up there. And then during the day, they sink down to the depths to try to avoid being eaten by predators. Uh, a really interesting strategy that is uh, really complex and still a lot to learn about it because it's out in an area that's difficult to study. Below the twilight zone, you have the abyssal zone, the deep sea where there is no light at all and a whole host of life forms that are adapted to that, some of those actually migrate up to the surface. Uh, some of the, the, the vertical migrations can be thousands of feet. It's really a remarkable situation. But it means that there's all this food down there that's moving up and down. And now the job of a seabird who is above the water is trying to figure out where is that food? How can I get to it without using up all the energy before I get there? So let's look at some of the seabirds and the different strategies they use to do that. So the bird on the right is the rhinoceros auklet. We saw that guy earlier uh, because they will sometimes be in close to shore and feeding on the near shore resources, but they will also venture far out to sea where they are primarily eating krill. Uh, they also eat small fish, larval fish. There are a lot of 
fish larvae that are semi-pelagic and drift around in the currents. Uh, and of course, squid. Everything out there is going to eat squid whenever they can get it. Interesting thing about both of these birds, the tufted puffin there on the left, you can see is in non-breeding plumage. This was a fall pelagic trip uh, out of Noyo a couple of years ago. And uh, both of these birds dive really well. They actually fly underwater. They use their wings to propel them. And uh, I know, I don't know exactly how deep puffins go, but I know Rhinoceros auklets can go uh, at least 60 meters, uh, around 200 feet, in, which is remarkable for a bird that breathes oxygen. This is one of my favorite little pelagic birds. Uh, this guy is a, maybe the size of your fist, a uh, little bitty bird, the Cassin's auklet. And they have that little bitty bill. So you probably guess that they're not really going after big fish. Uh, they are primarily krill specialists. So when you see these birds in the water, you're probably in a place where there's krill. Uh, again, they are great divers. In fact, I think cassins can go even deeper than the, uh, than the rhinos. Uh, and they fly like crazy underwater. Their wings propel them really well underwater. They can barely fly above the water surface. It's an enormous effort for them to get airborne. And uh, they have comically poor landing skills. They basically just stop flying and crash into the water. They're hard to see out there because they're so small, they tend to hide behind the waves. This is what they're eating. This is krill. In fact, I think this is the Pacific krill, Euthausia pacifica. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of species. There's, I think, a half dozen species of krill just in the North Pacific. And they're, of course, enormously important in the food web uh, in every ocean in the world, really but especially in the, the polar ones, the Arctic and Antarctic oceans, uh, where they occur in just colossal quantities. Uh, in, immense amounts of biomass are found in these krill swarms. And of course, famously, they are the food of the blue whale, the largest mammal on earth. And uh, these things are about an inch long. Some of them are an inch and a half, some are smaller, but uh, they, because they form these big swarms, uh, aggregate together, they're a concentrated food source. If you had to just swim around and eat them one at a time, uh, you'd have a harder time making a living. But a blue whale can come up and just gulp down a ton or two of these things at a shot. There's actually a copepod in here in this image as well, way over there to the left, uh, above, the, above the tidal. Uh, that little guy with the two antennae sticking out. Those are also very important uh, pelagic food sources, uh, especially when krill are not abundant. Sometimes copepods will be abundant in the absence of krill. And uh, birds like the Cassin's auklet can actually prey and graze on those directly, even though they're quite small. So can this little guy, uh, another tiny little seabird and another offshore bird that is virtually never seen from shore. They're hard enough to see in the open water uh, because they're so small. And as you can see, they don't stick out of the water very much. Uh, they're diving birds and most of them, most of their body is actually underwater. Uh, the Scripps's merlet um, is a pelagic seabird, a tiny little guy. There's actually several different species of merlet out there. And they have those little bills, uh, kind of a generalized bill so they can eat a variety of small prey, uh, and they eat a wide variety. Amphipods that come up to the surface, uh, they eat a lot of larval fish and fish eggs. Uh, turns out a lot of like flying fish lay their eggs in the surface waters and they just drift around in the currents and provide food for a lot of these birds. But they're a generalist. They're just basically getting whatever they can find. These guys, uh, have a, a great little adaptation. We are now into the true offshore birds, pelagic seabirds, uh, in the family Procellaridae, and better known as tube noses. So you can see a little bump on this guy's upper beak, and they have these little tubes that uh, serve a variety of functions. They're still actually studying these intensely to figure out what all they do. 
One thing they do is excrete salt so that these birds can actually drink seawater and excrete the salt and stay hydrated, uh, which is really important if you spend your entire life out at sea, as these birds do. They come ashore only to breed. And in fact, these storm petrels, this is the leeches storm petrel. Storm petrels, like most tube noses, breed in burrows on offshore rocks, uh, and they come in to their burrows before it's daylight and they spend the whole day underground and then they emerge after the sun goes down and go out to feed at night for the most part. Obviously this photo was taken in the daylight so they do venture out when they're not breeding uh, and feed during the day. But they, uh, they have to be able to find food out there and get it back to their young when they're breeding. So those tubes help them find food by a really acute sense of smell. Uh, these birds can literally smell krill and fish and uh, a variety of food that they eat just by the chemical signature that the water gives off. And so that's what they do, fly around the ocean sniffing and looking for prey. You can see it looks like it's kind of dancing on the water and it's really fun to watch them do that. They, uh, again, notice those very large wings relative to the small body they can kind of flutter along and stay aloft really easily. Uh, they catch uh, air that's pushed off the waves to help keep them up. And they patter their feet on the surface of the water. And just like the phalaropes, that tends to draw prey up to the surface where they can just pick it off. And they're generalist feeders picking off pretty much anything, any small prey, fish eggs, larval fish, amphipods, arthropods, crustaceans, all kinds of things that are coming up to the surface. Now we're getting into the really good flying birds. Now we're getting into birds that are adapted for long distance, low energy flight. So these birds have these stiff, broad wings. This is the Northern Fulmar, a bird that uh, in most years is quite difficult to see from land. Last year, they were quite abundant just offshore because, again, we had that enormous uh, anchovy population out there stretching all up and down the coast. And it, uh, the smell of those anchovies spread all the way out to sea and brought birds from all over the Pacific Ocean to come feed on them, including thousands of these northern fulmars, a bird that in, uh, ordinarily, if you can see one from shore, it's a pretty good year. And uh, on the Christmas bird count last year, David Jensen set up a scope uh, at Point Cabrillo and did timed counts and counted 300 fulmars in less than an hour, uh, just flying through the scope. So they were really abundant here. The, they are an abundant bird. Their population is thought to be around 2 million. So there's a lot of them, uh, but you don't usually see them because they're far offshore. Again, look at the beak, look at that tube on the top of its nose. They have extremely acute sense of smell. So they, they soar around on the ocean, flapping as little as possible and sniffing for fish and squid primarily. Uh, when you go out on a pelagic trip, if you put out a fish oil slick, these are usually the first bird to show up. They, they just come rocketing right in, drawn by the smell. They don't e exclusively eat fish and squid. Uh, this one was just outside the cove at Casper last December, uh, feeding on a dead jellyfish, which is probably a, not a very rewarding endeavor. And this is probably a juvenile fulmar, and it might be one of the ones that wound up washed up on the beaches uh, in December and January of last year. We had a kind of a fulmar wreck. And if there's time at the end, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what causes those. But uh, I just threw this in there to show you, one, how unconcerned fulmars are about uh, close approach. You can see my kayak there on the left. I'm only a few feet away from this bird and paid me no mind at all. And that's kind of characteristic of a lot of these uh, open ocean seabirds. They don't have mammalian predators. Uh, and they breed on isolated islands that historically did not have mammal predators. So they're not afraid of mammals and uh, famously will allow you very close approach. Uh, 
<laughs> getting into the better and better pliers. Okay, so the sooty shearwater, these are a really fascinating bird. Again, uh, we could spend an hour talking about them. A couple of things to notice here. Uh, one, he's running to take off. And why is that? He's got those big, long, narrow wings, uh, and they're adapted for soaring. So I mentioned the common myrrh had high wing loading. Sooty shearwaters have very low wing loading. The downside to that is, you know, the, the, the benefit obviously is you don't have to flap a lot uh, and you can soar with very little energy. So you can cover large distances uh, without a lot of cost. The downside is you have to keep moving and you need air movement to get you flying. If you look at the uh, ocean surface in this picture, you can tell there's not much air moving across the surface of the water here. It's an incredibly still day. On days like that, shearwaters don't fly. They just sit on the water. This one decided he wanted to get airborne. And to do that, he had to run across the surface of the water. His, his track extends quite a bit further off to the right of this photograph uh, because they have to get up quite a good speed before there's enough lift off those wings to keep them airborne. Once they get going and get off the water, uh, then it's a piece of cake for them. They can catch these little wind shears that are thrown off of waves and use them to stay airborne and, and gain speed without flapping their wings much. They do flap. Uh, sooty shearwaters, in fact, have a very characteristic flap, flap, glide pattern to their flight. You can recognize them just by that. I wanna say a little more about them because there's a lot uh, of really fascinating stuff about sooty shearwaters. They form immense flocks. They are thought to be possibly the most abundant seabird in the world, uh, which means possibly the most abundant bird in the world. Uh, the estimates of population in maybe 20 million birds worldwide. And they do this really interesting migration that I will talk about in the next slide, but they, they do it kind of en masse. And you get these huge flocks of shearwaters, uh, up to a million birds in a single flock. This picture was taken years ago off of Santa Cruz, actually. Uh, there was an episode in, uh, I think, in August of 1961, when a bunch of these shearwaters were in close to shore like this, and there was a red tide, a dinoflagellate bloom that caused uh, toxicity, gomoic acid toxicity and made the birds sick and crazy. And they started flying over land and crashing into houses and landing on people and cars and roofs. And it was insane. And a guy made a movie out of it. That was the genesis of Alfred Hitchcock's famous movie, The Birds, was the sooty Shearwater wreck of 1961. This is their migration route. This is very recent research. Uh, where they put these uh, geospatial tags on some of the breeding birds that they caught. They breed down there on rocky islands off of New Zealand. Uh, and so they caught a few of them and put tags on them and then followed to see where they went. Uh, they got a bunch more data than that, but that's what I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the blue... The blue tracks down around New Zealand are their foraging paths when they're breeding. And then the yellow tracks are the migration path routes that these individual birds took after they were done with breeding season. So you can see some of them flew over off the coast of Chile, South America, where there is also a small breeding population of shearwaters, sooty shearwaters. Uh, so they kind of went over there and visited with cousins for a while. And then they all take off and fly almost in a direct route across the open central Pacific uh, and then head over towards Japan and the Sea of Okhotsk and, uh, and then spend the off season, the non-breeding season up there feeding. The timing of this is really fascinating because they breed in, the, uh, in what is spring and summer off New Zealand, the Austral summer, and then they fly up into the North Pacific in the fall and winter here, but it's actually spring and summer for them. So basically they're like the Arctic turn 
the sun never sets on the Arctic turn. Not, not strictly true, but sooty shearwaters have the same strategy. They are basically flying to where the food is and just flipping back and forth between the southerly and northerly ocean. Uh, and then you can see that they, there is a population that's over on the Western Pacific and another population on the Eastern Pacific, right off California, Oregon, and Washington. And then uh, another population up uh, in the Bering Sea off Alaska. And then all of those populations turn around and go straight across the ocean back to New Zealand to breed. The total migration is something in the range of 40 to 60,000 miles. It is uh, the longest known migration of any animal on earth. It might not be the longest migration, it's just the longest one that we actually have studied enough to know about. So when they do that migration, they bring some friends with them or maybe not friends, but acquaintances. Uh, this is a little flock of sooties that were sitting on the water on a nice calm day, 30 miles offshore out of Fort Bragg. And that hulking brute that's flashing the big white wing panels is a South Polar skua, so named because they breed uh, on islands and rocks off Antarctica. And then in the non breeding season, like the sooty shearwater, they don't want to give up, they don't really want to spend winter in Antarctica. They would rather come up to California and Alaska where it's a little better eating. And it's not winter up here when it's winter in Antarctica. So they do the same kind of migration, only maybe not quite as complicated. They just follow shearwaters because skuas are also kleptoparasites. They just watch the shearwaters, and when they come up with a fish or a squid or whatever, they will go beat them up and steal their food. Pink-footed shearwaters have a very different uh, life story. They, they don't form those enormous flocks. There are far fewer of them, uh, only about 100,000, maybe, maybe a couple hundred thousand in the world. They are a much larger bird and they, uh, you can see they have very large wings, broad and long, and they're really well adapted to long distance flight. They fly, uh, like all shearwaters, they tend to fly low over the water there's a really good reason for that. Uh, it's something called dynamic soaring, where they're actually making use of the air currents that are being thrown off of the waves, the little turbulence and eddies and currents in the air. Uh, they use that to help them stay aloft uh, without flapping any more than necessary. So that's why you see shearwaters kind of swooping back and forth over the water. They're catching those air currents. These guys often are found in proximity to whales for one reason or another. They are feeding on the same food and it's not clear if they're visually following the whales or if their sense of smell guides them to the same food source that the whales are finding. And <laughs> almost finally, this uh, now we are getting to the extreme adaptation for long distance, low energy flight. The albatrosses are of course famous for that. Uh, this is one of the two species that we regularly find off our coastline uh, and the most abundant of the two, the black-footed albatross. They breed on Midway Island and some of the other islands in the Hawaiian archipelago, clear out in the Central Pacific. And during the breeding season, they take turns. One of the birds will sit on the egg and the other one will fly over to the offshore California coast to feed and will do so for several days and then turn around and fly back. So that's a journey of almost 3,000 miles one way uh, just to go get some food. It's really amazing. Uh, and there's all kinds of statistics about the, uh, the flight of the albatross, how many miles an albatross will cover in its lifetime, all kinds of interesting stuff way too much to get into. I just want to draw your attention again to the wings. Look how long they are. Uh, notice this guy has just trailed one feather tip on the surface of the water. It's remarkable how often you see them do that out there. The, uh, the wings are quite flexible. So you see there, this guy's wings are kind of bent down 
and that's really common with albatrosses. The wing loading is so low that their their wings aren't bent upward from the weight of, of their own bodies. Uh, they're quite often kind of bent down like this, and they apparently use that to help catch and sort of cup air uh, coming off of the those little air currents. Watching them soar and fly is one of the truly great joys of pelagic seabirding. This is the other species of albatross that we have off uh, that comes to forage here. They also breed on the same islands as Blackfooted out in the Central Pacific, Midway famously, and uh, some of the other islands out there. Uh, this is the Laysan albatross, and these are famous because the world's oldest known bird is a Laysan albatross known as Wisdom. Uh, and nobody knows how old she actually is, but she is a minimum of 70 years old because she was banded as an adult in 1956. Uh, and they don't lay an egg. And the youngest age at any, that any Laysan albatross ever lays an egg is five years old. Some of them don't start laying eggs until they're older than that. Uh, and she laid an egg the year that they banded her. That's, that's how they caught her to band her. The only time you can really study these things like that is when they're breeding, because that's the only time they come on land. So they're still working out how long do albatrosses live? It's a question no one actually knows the answer to. What, what is their maximum lifespan? Because the oldest known one is still around. Uh, these guys do the same thing that the Blackfooteds. They fly all the way over from Midway Island to forage off the California coast. Uh, they trail a little wingtip in the water like this one is doing. Uh, there's, uh, there is some, uh, one statistic. Uh, they, they have been tracking some of the flight paths of these things. And uh, one Laysan albatross did a foraging flight. So they, the, those last about a week when they're breeding. And it covered an area of ocean of about 4 million acres. So they, they really cover a lot of ground when they're, when they're wandering the oceans. These both Blackfooted and Laysan, by the way, are known as the small albatrosses because their wings are only about seven or eight feet across. The uh, wandering albatross is the, the giant. Its wingspan is around 12 feet, but they don't unfortunately come into the North Pacific. And so I don't have any pictures of them. Uh, we can see these as close to shore. We saw two of them last February on a short mini pelagic uh, three hour trip. And we got about six miles offshore and saw two place in albatrosses. So they make an epic flight over here. Talking about the food web again, uh, all, all of the albatrosses feed primarily on squid and secondarily on fish. And they quickly adapted to the presence of a new thing in their environment, which is fishing vessels. So they probably immediately found out, found these things by smell because fishing boats smell very strongly of fish and they have an acute sense of smell. So albatrosses famously follow ships all over the ocean. You can see some following this fishing vessel out of, uh, this fishing out of Noyo. Uh, and so whenever we're doing a plagic, we tend to look for fishing boats and then go see if they have a fan club following them and find some great birds that way. The albatrosses do benefit from this uh, because when the nets are pulled up, a lot of fish spill out of them. So they gobble those up and the boats are constantly throwing off scraps of fish and things like that. So they get some food out of it, but there's also a drawback uh, because there are this is not a drift net boat, but there are such things. And drift nets catch uh, a terrifying number of seabirds and they drown when they get caught in the net. So uh, it's both pluses and minuses to this new, new thing in their environment. These two uh, billing and cooing, they actually were vocalizing. These were the only albatrosses I've ever heard vocalize. They were feeding on that Thing that's floating in front of them and we couldn't tell what it was so we motored over there and pulled it out of the water to look at it and it is a giant grenadier 
a fish that lives on the bottom of the ocean in the abyssal depths. Uh, I think that at the time this photo was taken, we were over about 3,000 feet of water, but we had passed not long before that a black cod fishing vessel, and we suspect that this grenadier got pulled up by a, a black cod fisherman and then couldn't swim back down after it was thrown, thrown away, uh, and so it became albatross food. So again, they make use of whatever they can find, and the introduction of humans to their environment in some ways has added a new way of finding food. Well, that uh, pretty much concludes my talk this evening. I want to thank some people, especially my co-host of the Ecology Hour, Bob Spies, uh, who put me in touch with so many scientists over the past few years. And we've interviewed some eminent marine biologists and most of what I know about the science has come from those conversations. Uh, the Mendocino Coast Audubon Society uh, for many years has sponsored pelagic seabirding trips out of Noyo Harbor. And if you want to uh, find out about those, you can drop me an email, audubon at mcn.org. Uh, we do short trips and long trips both. Uh, but they are uh, an introduction to a world few people actually experience. And then of course, Roger, Becky, and Shannon for the great photographs, and especially all the great scientists who figured all this stuff out so I could talk about it tonight. Thanks very much for listening, and I'm happy to answer questions. Wonderful, Tim. I always learn something every single time I listen to a science talk, and I learned a great deal. Tonight, Tim, thank you for sharing all of that deep knowledge about seabirds. Tim's the kind of guy that digs in deep and finds out more and more about an individual bird than it, 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 anyway. He, thank you. <laughs> there's so much to know about these birds. And um, there sure is. Yeah, there, there's there's so much to know, so much to talk about. You know, I, you know me well. You know I can just go on and on and on about this stuff. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, and it's all out there. I mean, those pictures were taken mostly by local photographers yeah. and mostly, uh, except for the shorebirds there uh, on these pelagic trips, which I can hardly stand to stay on shore when I hear that there's a pelagic trip going out because, and, and, a, and a whole day at sea is never enough yeah. for those that love the pelagic trips. Um, they are amazing and beautiful and a whole new world opens up when you get out there on the ocean. Um, it really is truly something everybody should experience if they don't get seasick, uh, yeah. that being a pretty big, big bummer. Yeah. But, um, One of the things I didn't really mention uh, is we're almost uniquely fortunate here in having access to the open water so close, deep water. Uh, the, the continental shelf is remarkably narrow here. And so the Noyo Canyon, for example, is only the upper end of it is only about six or seven miles offshore. So you can get in a boat and in half an hour, you can be over two or 3,000 feet of water. And uh, you're out there with the Jaegers and the albatrosses. And in most places, it's a lot farther. You'd have to take a boat and motor for two or three hours to get out. To the albatross water so we're really fortunate here true true hey um i did have a couple chats while you were talking and if people want to chime in uh i'll get through these chats real quick and then if we want to stick around tim i don't know if you've got anything to run away for but if you don't we will we usually have such an audience that that, that people re really like to have a conversation with our speaker. So if you Happy don't do mind, it, you, you just tell you cry uncle when you're ready to go have some good whiskey um, or cider or whatever it is you've got going. <laughs> um, I know that earlier on, uh, Sue Holly chimed in and said that they were seeing, I think right now is that Bodega Bay. Um, seeing a lot of feeding whales and pelicans uh -huh. um, yeah i don't see that chat anymore but feel free to to uh to chime in sue i were you seeing feeding whales and seabirds and pelicans off of bodega bay 
Is that it? Are you still, maybe she's not here anymore. Well, they probably are. They, I think they, yeah, they, they've been starting to move north and move in close to shore. Uh, I'm going to go on a pelagic actually out of Sausalito in just a couple of weeks. Ooh. Yeah. Lucky you. <laughs> yeah, it'll be my first trip to the Farallones. Wow. I've actually been oh. out to the Farallon Islands, so. Wow. Over Lucky there. you. Vicariously living through your experience, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, oh, yeah, here it is. Yeah, it's in Half Moon Bay, Sue Holly was saying. Oh, yeah. There's lots of bird and whale activity right now. Um, so, so Half Moon Bay. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, and then let's see. Pacifica also unusual were gray whales lunge feeding. Wow. Huh. Yep. So down down south of the San Francisco there in Pacifica area and Half Moon Bay area, seeing gray whales lunge feeding. And interestingly, uh, uh, Tim and Bob Spees were just speaking to a gray whale scientist down there, and he was talking about if the gray whales lose out on their benthic food that they may turn to fish, that they're one of the very adaptive types of, one of the few very adaptive or opportunistic feeding whales um, through time, but uh, that's- Yeah, that really was an interesting, I, I didn't know that about him until he told us that on the show. And that was really fascinating to, to hear about. Uh, that they can change their, because they have an unusual strategy. They don't feed like any other whale. And right. to be able to shift to a different feeding strategy is a remarkable and kind of resilience, really. Yeah, it will serve them well in the years to come. And it, I think it has historically served them well in that they're more opportunistic than other whales. So um, folks, don't be shy. If you have some questions for Tim, please, please, uh, you know, I'm happy to unmute you or you can unmute yourself if you want to say hello. Hello, Doug Forcell down in the South. We, you know, this birding group of us, we sure do have a lot of fun together. We go to sea together. We do bird surveys together. And um, for those of you who don't know, yes, I am Noyo Center and I do do marine mammal response, but I'm pretty nutty about birds and bird people and everything birdy as well. Um, I just and, wanted to mention that. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, a good friend of mine is one of the people who's working on the uh, uh, Western sandpipers in the film with the diatoms in it. Uh -huh. One of the interesting things about diatoms is they're the only thing that makes omega fatty acids. And so all of that's what the uh, huh. is providing the energy to the migrating um, shorebirds um, <clears throat> up there. It's a stopover place for uh, migration. They happen to be studying it because it was <clears throat> near a port that was going to be expanded in British Columbia. But um, that's why they're getting so so much from that film is that it's. Uh, has a long time developed from a low tide and these uh, mud flats being available and for those diatoms to grow really fast. And, and I was amazed, but uh, that's why omega fatty acids are, we get them from Manhattan and everything that's feeding on mm -hmm. uh, diatoms. Yeah, that is fascinating that uh, I only recently learned that the part of why diatoms are so important in our food web is the, they store uh, you know, most plants make carbohydrates, and that's the food source that the mammals are getting when they graze them. But diatoms actually make oils. Yeah. That's that's their chemical energy. I didn't know it was omega fatty acids, which is even better, right? I mean, yeah. So they're yeah, like a dietary supplement. Interesting. Thanks, Doug. Yeah. Yeah. Really fascinating. And Sally Swan was saying that um, I know that a few people have seen that uh, it's been making the news that there's been um, a pelican crisis down near San Luis Obispo and the bird rescue people down in the south area have been really busy uh, with, with um, pelicans coming in injured and ill and weak and whatnot. And I haven't heard too much in this last week 
um, but she's wondering if it could be related to the large pelican population seen last year. If there was an, if there was an uptick population-wise, I don't know. But then um, winds, winds seem to really. I mean, they, of course, they affect currents and weather and all of that. But um, high winds could be maybe suspect when we have these seabird wrecks or um, you know, also the marine mammal wrecks. Like I had whatever 13 animals in a short span of two weeks um, and possibly the wind pushed them in uh, live and dead um, from out there. Um, and we know winds, winds affect all sorts of things. Um, so I don't know if anybody knows anything, Tim, about the uh, pelican crisis down south or I, I don't know, uh, but you're right. The uh, sustained high wind, you know, it extracts an energy cost and the pelicans are migrating north right now, uh, right? We've just seen a few of them up here so far, but, and all the ones I've seen have all been juveniles. So the post breeding dispersal is just kind of getting started. And so very likely there are a lot of young birds on the move. And as you know, a lot of young birds just aren't gonna make it. Uh, and it's even harder for them if they have to fight their way upwind, if they're trying to fly north against unusually strong or unusually persistent north winds. Now they are extremely good at flying into the wind. So it's not something that they're not adapted for. Uh, so it's most likely a combination of factors. You know, I mentioned with the Northern anchovy, that it's pretty rare for northern anchovies to, to follow a boom year with another boom year. Last year, uh, at least off of the northern California coast, was clearly a boom year for anchovies. So you can kind of expect that this year there's going to be less of them around. And the pelicans probably had a spectacularly successful breeding season last year. And there's now a lot of pelicans out there looking for food. So, Right. So that kind of does tie back into to, into that conversation for sure, Sally. And then Peggy was wondering, um, wonderful presentation, she says, and how does the blob factor into the food uh, web and or the food chain? Yeah, I, great I heard question. someone say something about a potential new blob developing. I just heard it tonight at dinner and I was like, oh, God, no, please. Yeah. <laughs> Can we just enjoy some cold water for a few years here? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't um, know if anybody's heard. But. So, yeah, that's a great question and could lead to a, probably another half an hour discussion. But <laughs> I'll try to I do want to talk a little bit about that though, and answer that question because it has a huge effect on the food web. Uh, so I, I talked about the difference between the open ocean uh, food chain and the near shore food chain. So the, when you get, uh, when the upwelling doesn't happen or doesn't happen consistently enough, you can get that five-step food chain developing in the near shore system as well. Uh, and it can turn quickly. So you can, uh, if the winds, for example, as they did a few years ago, you remember, Sarah, a wreck of common MERS, just a, that was only two or three years ago. And mm -hmm. that was, that came right after a period of south wind in May, mm -hmm. which is, you know, kind of unusual here. And it caused downwelling. <laughs> so not only did the system, did the upwelling not happen, but the opposite happened. And that was you know, kind of a short-term catastrophe. And a whole bunch of MERS suddenly couldn't find food and washed up on the beaches. So in the, the, pel the blob though, this is, and, and for the people that aren't, don't know what the blob was, uh, in 2013, there was an unusual warming event started to form out in the Central Pacific. And then it just got bigger and bigger every year for five consecutive years. So in 2014 and 2015, they were talking about the North Pacific blob. And it was, they called it that because the map of sea surface temperature anomaly showed this huge red blob covering most of the North Pacific, meaning the, the surface of the ocean was two or three degrees in some cases warmer than normal, which is a, just a huge change. 
and it meant that that surface water was depleted of nutrients. Uh, it was stratified, it wasn't mixed. And so there's almost no food available in the open ocean. And that's normal in the central Pacific out in the middle of the open water. But the blob extended all the way, uh, eventually all the way to the coastline, to the Eastern Pacific shore. And that was catastrophic. Uh, and Shut, it actually shut off upwelling in most of the coast, not quite all of it. Um, and we had outbreaks of uh, HAB, harmful algal bloom, uh, as Julia Parrish calls them. Uh, I mentioned those dinoflagellates and cyanobacteria, and there's a, several different species that uh, are not just hard to eat, but they produce toxins, uh, principally domoic acid, the most notorious of them. And uh, domoic acid is a nerve toxin. So it just messes up the wildlife, something fierce. It actually can make them crazy uh, as well as sick and, and, and it can kill them. Uh, so you get domoic acid outbreaks from the blob and so, you know, that affected everything all the way up to humans uh, because we, the, the Dungeness crab fishery was closed because of domoic acid. Uh, so the blob had an enormous effect on the food web. Essentially what happened was it shut off the nearshore productivity. And instead of a three-step food chain, we had a five-link five food chain. And that means that uh, you can only feed about 1% as much biomass as you could normally. So think about that, you know, that's 99% of everything out there is struggling to find food. Uh, so that's the blob basically just completely disrupted the nearshore marine food chain when, when it extended all the way over to the coastline. And even before that, uh, it disrupted productivity in the, in the near offshore, I would, you know, the, the zone from five miles to maybe a hundred miles offshore, where ordinarily uh, Ekman Transport will push some of this enriched surface water out that far, uh, and it mixes up and provides food for all those pelagic seabirds, and that whole process just completely shut off. So the only food to be had was right here on the uh, on the Mendocino coast and a few other places where upwelling was still happening. So you remember the wreck of the Cassin's Auklet? The uh, thousands and thousands of those little Cassin's Auklets that I mentioned early in the program uh, washed up on, on the beaches in, starting in October and going all the way through into like January, I think. And that was 2014, 15, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was because of what I just talked about. That was, uh, uh, that was, the, the Cassin's Auklet, uh, Julia Parrish did a great presentation after that. Uh, they really did some amazing scientific work to figure out what had happened there. And it turned out the main cause of that wreck wasn't that an unusual number of auklets were dying. It was that they were dying unusually close to shore. So normally those Cassin's Auklets would be scattered out uh, over the North Pacific up to a hundred miles from shore, just chasing krill that's drifting around on the California current. But the California current was all messed up and there was no food out there far offshore. The only place they could find anything to eat was within about five or six miles of the coastline. So all the Cassin's auklets were crammed up close to shore. So when they started dying in the winter, as they always do, because there's about 5 million of them. Uh, and so a lot of young ones die every winter. Uh, just the relentless math of, of natural populations. And normally most of those dead auklets would not be seen because they would sink before they reached the shoreline. Uh, but because they were so close to shore, almost all of them wound up washing up on the beaches. And it was terrifying <laughs> to experience as a human, uh, this bizarre phenomenon. Yeah. But that was just uh, a, basically a manifestation of the effect of the blob on the ocean food web. Yeah. In, in short, and, it was utterly catastrophic. 
Absolutely. Yeah, the, the monitoring of what washes ashore is, is just critical to so much of these, to so many of these conversations, really. The Cassin's Auckland wreck, the Mer wreck. Um, there was a, a mini Fulmar. Well, I don't know if it, it qualified as a wreck, but it was pretty intense, yep. fast and furious. And to those people in the audience that go around and pick up dead and dying birds with me, you, you know who you are. <laughs> um, uh, but someone just said that the pelicans that are coming in, I guess that there's 240 or so at last count at uh, International Bird Rescue in Long Beach, and most and all were emaciated. Um, all age classes, so probably uh, food supply issue. Yep. So what we learn from these birds that come ashore, you know, I get maybe in trouble for being a person who wants to save all creatures, but it's way beyond that. It's about documenting what's going on and getting getting the carcasses to the scientists who are studying these, getting the numbers and, uh, you know, these beach surveys, whether it be coastal observation seabird survey team or the Noyo Center's um, beach survey or, or the one to the south of us, their beach watch, you know, good, good work, really important work. And um, Derek Harvey is here and he's um, in Medford, but was very interested in getting uh, word up about the pelagic trips um, out of out of Noyo. Um, so I think you can probably follow up with Tim, um, yep. email him, send an email to Audubon at mcn.org, um, and then you will be on, on Tim's radar. And Tim has, you know, we've been doing these bigger pelagic trips or, and then a half a day pelagic trip. And then more recently, Tim has, and, and Audubon have been kind of doing these mini <laughs> pelagic trips and jumping onto a fishing boat that's going out for a couple hours. That's how, how crazy we get about getting out on the ocean. Um, so, yeah. yeah we, we do have a, an all-day pelagic scheduled for October 1 Oof. out of Noyo Harbor those tickets go really, really fast. So <laughs> um, yeah, put me down. <laughs> uh, it's just, October tends to be that time of year when the ocean can lie down flat, it can be warm, um, yeah. different conditions, and then it's a time of change. But uh, Tim, I, I we may, may want to wrap it up here and give your voice a rest unless anybody has any other uh, questions for Tim. I was just going to pass on one thing, kind of a bright note. I just spent the last two mornings out with UC Santa Cruz in vertebrate sampling, and uh, looks like abalone are really coming back nicely. Interesting. And um, we had a lot of abalone in some of the plots, uh, and so uh, it was very encouraging. It's been increasing the last two or three years, and not so many uh, urchins. So. Nice. Really so that's interesting. Down, that's down Point Arena way. That's just yeah. south of Point Arena. Stornetta and um, uh, Sea Ranch. Nice. Good news. I think they're headed up your way now. <laughs> nice. Tomorrow. I don't know where, where their station is. They go all the way through Oregon. So I don't know where their station is that they're heading to. Oh, um, it may be, I don't know if they have one in Fort Bragg. Otherwise, it's... Um, I know they end up in uh, Crescent City, but um, and then in Southern Oregon. Nice. But anyway, it's nice to see. Yeah. You know, count over a hundred abalone in a plot. You know? Nice. <laughs> that is good. We'll take good news wherever it comes up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I noticed the Portuguese beach kelp patch is starting to look pretty good again. Yeah, and the patches down here have been looking better each year. Good, good. Yeah, and off of Mendocino, off of uh, Spring Ranch there, it's starting to look dark out in the water and, you know, all, all related to that fabulous upwelling or, or, yeah. or things that we don't understand, you know, just, just stay curious. Yes. Much as I hate that constant wind out here living on the coast, but <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's uh, worth it for what it does. You, yep. you know a local when you hear them say, oh, we love the wind. <laughs> yeah. We love the wind and rain. <laughs> we know how important it is. All right. First, well, First you get wind and then you get whales. Yeah, yep. <laughs> exactly. Great. Well, uh, 
Tim, many, many, many thanks to you from all over the place and um, clapping hands and, and excellent presentation. Um, thank you for your bird knowledge and for your, for your being here with us. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Um, stay tuned for our upcoming science talks. And um, yeah, it's all marine science. We're all in it together. So thank you one and all for being here with us tonight. Take Thanks care. for having me, Sarah. It was really a lot of fun. Great. Thank you, Tim. Thanks a million.